Tucker Tin Goose, the prototype, uh, built in 1947. We're uh, very pleased to have with us uh, Preston T. Tucker's grandson, John Tucker, is here with us today. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Mark. This, uh, hopefully, you all know at least what this is. This is a 1948 Tucker. Uh, this car was the very first car built. Uh, the movie, if you've seen the movie, it was built in 60 days for the unveiling on June 21st of 47 to kick off the company. Somehow, miraculously, Preston got the largest plant in the world. How he did that, uh, was a miracle by itself. He was from Southeast Michigan and dreamed of cars since he was a little kid. And uh, as he grew up, he learned to sell sell cars. He fixed up cars and sell them. Ended up in Indianapolis which is where he met Harry Miller, who was probably the most famous race car designer in the United States, at least maybe in the world. And the two of them dreamed about building a car. All through the war, he did war. He did, he, his factory pumped out some things for the, for the, for the uh, war effort in Ypsilanti, Michigan. But then uh, he and, he and uh, Harry talked about building this car all through the war. Harry died in 1943. So instead of letting it die, he wanted to build it as a tribute to him. So most of these ideas were things that he and Harry had talked about all through the war. So the car is pretty unique. Um, it had uh, four-wheel independent suspension. It had air aircraft style door. This car is only 60 inches tall. So you could uh, you didn't hit you, didn't lose your hat back then when you got into the car. Uh, one of the most unique things about it was the, the engine. It was a flat, opposed, uh, water-cooled, uh, flat six engine uh, converted from a helicopter. And, uh, it's not in here. This is uh, it's where the, uh, the luggage went. So the engine was in the rear of the car. So that surprised, uh, surprised, surprised a lot of our gas station attendants in the old days. <laughs> but, uh, it had the center headlight, which was the most popular. Uh, that, that only worked when it got past 10 degrees. It didn't, it didn't uh, when you were going straight, the light was out, and then you could turn the wheel, it would light up. Okay. Originally, the design that Preston wanted was uh, pontoon fenders that actually turned with the, with the wheel. But they found out through racing and through uh, Bonneville that that didn't work. The car could actually get airborne. A few cars did get airborne with that design and killed some. Alex Tremulous, who was the designer, talked him out of that. He apologized and he said, well, let's do that. But the car had 13-inch uh, tires, which were smaller than most tires at that time, and he had Firestone build a bigger, more of a balloon-type tire. With all magnesium, magnesium wheels, so the, the, uh, This actually has the original bumper. It did not have the original bumper. Um, but she, Pat Swiger got the car. The car is owned by Pat Swiger, who's right over there. Hello, Pat. She bought the car in 1998 uh, from the guy that restored it. And the next day, liked it so much, she bought another Tucker. Her and Bill Swiger. So they have two, two, two uh, cars in their museum in, in Huntington, Pennsylvania, the oldest car museum in the country. So Pat is a true car collector. She's one of the guys. I call her the first lady of car collecting. <laughs> she, she loves driving them. She loves working on them. A couple other features um, the car had. The front and rear seat were interchangeable. I've still never seen that in another car. You, your front seat started to wear out. You just pulled it out, unbolted it, <laughs> put the back seat in the front, and you have a fresh seat. So you're going to get twice as much out of your car. So, uh, that, uh, the front windshield popped out. It had a very ingenious thing that was, a, I call the most naive idea in history, but it had a crash compartment in the passenger side front seat. So if you knew you were going to get in a crash, you just jump down in there and you're completely safe. <laughs> <laughs> Never would have worked, but <laughs> one of the other things that did work though was he had the frame made in the front so that it was it formed a V, like a boat. So unless you got hit directly head on, this whole, this whole side would just shear right off. So it would flinch the car off to the side. So two Tuckers hit each other, they're not going to get hurt like that. So um, I just actually noticed on this trip, this last week, um, the, the hood ornament was supposed to be a tribute to Harry Miller, his, his friend. 
This one actually has a little bit different, but if you look at a real Tucker, you can actually even see the, the guy's helmet uh, on, the, on the torpedo. Which brings me to one other point, that is that they, most people call this the Tucker torpedo. This is not called the Tucker torpedo. The only Tucker torpedo was the original concept that George Lawson did. And uh, that car, because of the, the board of directors, a bunch of Detroit guys, decided that uh, that would be too dangerous, sound too dangerous, so they changed it to the Tucker 48. Dump the idea of the torpedo. But, uh, that's uh, pretty much a nutshell of the car. Um, my sons actually are uh, have formed a new company, the New Tucker Corporation, and they're building that torpedo that was the original concept. So all, all out of metal, all hand hammered. It'll be a two-year project, but then it'll be a it'll be it'll tour the country and be a at least building just one. Just one. That's all they're going to build. It's already been purchased by a guy who's financing the project and. Uh, It'll never go to anyone else. So. And they have the right to, to campaign it as long as they want. They've built uh, the Ida Brothers in New Jersey have built a couple other Tuckers, which are beautiful cars out of uh, resin. And my sons are involved with that as well. So uh, the Tucker name will go on forever. So that's that's kind of uh, gratifying for me. I, I never got to do it myself, but now I'm watching my sons do it. So it's, it's really really gratifying. Any questions? But uh, I mean, just I guess a uh, just a point about what a change, a sea change, this car created, and what a sensation it created. I mean, this is Chicago, right. uh, just yeah. on the street, I think, at the time. Yeah, and uh, I mean, after the war, of course, all the companies had been busy fighting the war, so the automobile companies brought out the same 1942 cars and 1941 cars. So Preston had fresh slate. And he was able to do this because he didn't have any, any any baggage from from the old car company. So and he also did it in Cicero, Illinois, which was away from Detroit. So Kaiser, had, I think actually secretly my dad, my grandfather wanted to get the bomber plant in Ypsilanti as it built the B-29s, but uh, Kaiser had that pretty locked up because it was pretty well known. So he set his sights on actually, which was the biggest plant in the world in Chicago. Somehow got it, as I said earlier. Started doing is he was going to build all kinds of things in that plant. He had so many ideas. He built refrigerators, and who knows what in it because it was so huge. But that's you know, people flocked to this car like that because it was new. They wanted a new car. They didn't want an old 1942 Buick or Oldsmobile or Lincoln. So they, this was the car. That a lot of people say that it was the the other car companies that put them out of business, and they probably were somewhat behind that. But the government really was what put him out of business, and public opinion. That uh, once the, he fought the battle over the, he got sued by the government. Once he cleared his name, it was too late. The money was all gone, and they couldn't they couldn't get the company going again. So in 1950, they auctioned off the last few cars that were at the factory. Some built, some not built, and uh, the company died. But I was born in 1953. Nobody cared about the Tucker car anymore. But uh, Preston still did. Well, the rest it was of one of the first uh, uh, speculative IPOs, uh, yeah. initial <laughs> public offerings, uh, right. raised $17 million, uh, and uh, one of the documents that we recently got was an original perspectives from back then, and, uh, which is very interesting reading. Uh, and uh, they needed uh, a bit more money, I guess, along the way to, so one of the ways that they were also financing was also going out and promoting dealerships and by having dealers sign up and pay, pay them cash. And, so there was a lot of just, uh, I mean, there was a lot of speculation about the car and, and, and everything. And, and one of the things that also happened was that uh, they really needed about two million more. So, and apparently, I guess after the war, you could have, if you were, if you were coming out as uh, as ex-military, you essentially went. And I'm not sure there wasn't any law around this. It was just that out of courtesy, any dealer that was selling a car, you were put at the head of the list. Right. And I uh, and. Uh, the Tucker Company needed to raise some more money, and so the fact that this Tucker, Tucker Topics right. uh, that we That's have right. yeah. uh, has in the back the accessory group that they were selling. So you could go out and buy, because it was ahead of the car, you could buy your luggage that was going to fit in the Tucker. <laughs> right. And uh, so they went on a campaign to do this, which was brilliant, and then you got on the list, and you already owned some Tucker stuff, so... Which could go in any... You know, any in Tucker. Anything. Yeah. But you could use your luggage anywhere. They also sold a, a radio. With the, with the name Tucker on it. There's a lot of those out there. A lot of you have probably seen those. 
had seat covers. So you could buy those three items. You'd buy a package of two or three of being smart and knowing how to bundle things all back then. And you'd get your, your sequence number, which meant you were guaranteed that number of car from the factory. And then, and, 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 and that's this, it, that luggage, is, uh, yeah. is there some of that still available? Oh yeah, we have one set in our museum. Most people that own cars have a set of luggage generally. Oh, really? <laughs> There's a lot of them out there. Really? Get, uh, yeah. They also had a... Tucker luggage. You know, that's what yeah. Tucker luggage. Probably one of the most sought after things is a Tucker Ashtray. They made a, oh. back then cigarettes were a big thing. So they had a picture, they had a Tucker, about a 124 scale model, a die cast piece of metal, mounted on the brickyard in Indianapolis, which is where he, he gained most of his experience. And then he flipped it up in your cigarettes when there's little, the little uh, filterless camels or lucky strikes, which is what ended up killing him, by the way. <laughs> he died of lung cancer. But uh, that, you could get a light. He had lighters that he would give out. So they learned to promote them. But they, uh, you know, by then, he, he always said, he was one of the uh, fellows that he, he bought the air cooled motors plant in Syracuse, New York, before the engines. He went in and, and uh, actually, Howard Hughes did tell him about that. It was shown in the movie. He didn't meet him personally, but he called him and said, There's this really nice plant that has a lot of steel, and they also have this really great engine. So he went there to make a deal with them. and. Uh, what walked in and said, I want the next 50 engines off that line. And they, they went, well, you can't have the next 50 engines. Those are going to Bell Helicopter. So he went upstairs, bought the company, came back down and says, I want those 50 engines <laughs> shipped to Ypsilanti. And they did. They ended up shipping uh, about 150 engines to Ypsilanti, which still, there's more of those. They go for about $25,000 for, for one of those. This car originally had the 589 engine, which was his, his own design in Harry Miller's. But when they bought the plant, they convert. This car now has the 348 mm -hmm. helicopter. So water cooled, not air cooled. Uh, talk about the uh, the original design engine and uh, being able to go in reverse and all that, and uh, and, well, then the, and 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 where the uh, where the term tin goose came from. Oh right. Well, yeah. The uh, it was a, the original engine was done with torque converters, in direct drive. So in order to in, in order they did have a way to reverse the car. But in order to do that, you had to stop the engine, start it in the engine in reverse, and back it up. <laughs> not quite, not quite going to work. But, uh, the, the reason this is called the Tin Goose is because Pre uh, Preston had been also involved with Auburn Court Duesenberg before the war, and so he knew a lot of the people there, and he needed to get this car built in 60 days. So he had the tin knockers from Auburn Court Duesenberg come up, and they, they built this car in 60 days. All out of tin. Never, it never was done in in, uh, in clay, which was unheard of back then. But, but they had this car in 60 days, so it's uh, pretty amazing. So this car is in, always called the Tin Goose. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's I mean I, in reading on on this, there's a lot of different versions as to why it was called the Tin Goose. But it was called the Tin Goose because it was built out of tin by these guys. Right. Tin is a lot of lead. Yeah, this lot car of, probably yeah. weighs yeah. 6,000 pounds because. You know, you get it close, and they're going, well, i got to get this done tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Splatter a bunch of lead on it. Yeah, well, not surprisingly, one of the things we're doing with the documentation, we just did it on the myers Banks, is actually weighing how we've got the scales to weigh the cars. We couldn't get a level spot here. We didn't right. feel comfortable doing it down here. But we are very curious as to how much it actually does. Yeah, I love Because there's all, everybody always says, it really weighs a lot. Well, let's figure out exactly how much it does. <laughs> So. Well, my son Sean has done some calculations. He thinks it's closer to 7,000 pounds. Yeah. So we'll, 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 see, we'll see how good of an engineer he is. Yeah, yeah the, the uh, spec sheet said something like 9,000. I said, no, you can't do that. But it does, I mean, that, the lead in this area. Well, yeah, it was a torso, torso elastic suspension, basically, which was rubber, a rubber boot, and then everything worked off of that, and the right compound of rubber. And it just this car was so heavy that it just failed. It worked okay on the regular cars, but uh, it just failed on these. And, uh, there's a fellow in, in Detroit now building the torso elastic suspension. For an, any owners that are restoring their cars, they can have that. It's about $20,000 for a set of the thing. So he gets paid for it. But, yeah. <laughs> they, they would never work on this car. Any other questions? Oh, we're getting ready to lose it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Kate, you need to go more. You don't want that to fall on the ground.
no, no. So go ahead. Do you have a question? Or, or the kids, either one. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. From the museum? Yeah. yeah. It's been in the museum since uh, since the early 80s. It was donated to us by Sherwood Marshall, who was the uh, original purchaser. Unusual color for a DMC. Well, it's gold plate. Oh, really? Yeah, it's real gold plate. That's 24 karat gold. Okay, wow. Yeah, that was, like I said, I explained, that was the special promotion that John DeLorean and American Express came up for the gold card catalog in 1986. Well, that's too bad. And there's only two of them. I'll check back every spot. Yeah, you do that. I'm attached to my toys. They don't go anywhere. Yeah. Uh, the next car that we're thrilled to talk about and, uh, is, I, it's, it's just so wonderful to have this particular vehicle here. And I think everybody walks by and says, wow, what's, what's going on here? Well, back in 1980, uh, American Express put out their Christmas catalog and they cut a deal with the DeLorean. And the idea was to promote DeLorean and to promote something very special uh, to their card members. And they wanted to sell gold-plated DeLoreans as true indulgence. So I think we have the first car over here next to it, or the oldest car in America, uh, the oldest running car, and then on the other end, really a gold-plated indulgence at that time. Yeah. And uh, Jay Hubbard is here uh, from the, <clears throat> the National Automotive Museum in Reno, Nevada, the Hera Collection, and he is collections manager, yep. and he's here to tell us about this wonderful gold-plated DeLorean. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, collections manager, that means I get to play with the cars. Um, what we have here is a 1981 DMC-12. It's the brainchild of John Zachary DeLorean. And though the history of the car is not very long, the history of John DeLorean goes back to just after World War II. He emerges uh, with his honorable discharge. He completes his schooling at the Lawrence Technological Institute, where he becomes an engineer. He goes on to work for Chrysler and then for Packard. And in 1956, he's recruited by Pontiac Division to become an engineer. And this is where he really blossoms. As an engineer at Pontiac, he becomes the father of the GTO and the Y Track series, the Pontiac Muscle Cars. At the age of 40, he's advanced to general manager of Pontiac Division. He brings Pontiac from sixth place to third place in sales during his tenure. In 1969, he's advanced again to head of Chevrolet Division. There, he promotes the new body Corvette, Camaro, the rebodied Chevrolet trucks. He brings Chevrolet up to three million units in one year. He's tapped again to become general manager of automotive and truck sales in North America. He's within a grasp of becoming president of the entire General Motors organization. When he comes, he gets disenchanted with the entire General Motors way of doing things. And he quits. Some say he was asked to quit, some say he was out and out fired. John DeLorean says that he's gone on to his higher calling. And he's looking to produce what he calls a moral and ethical automobile. He goes on to form the John DeLorean Company, becomes a management consultant, and then he gets a call from Allstate to build a safety car, a car that is going to be, uh, you know, envelop all the safety uh, options that are available in technology that day. He develops the DSV, DeLorean Safety Vehicle. He goes to Italy and to Giorgetto Giugiaro, who's designed a lot of interesting uh, Maserati automobiles and some other more pedestrian cars. They come up with a design that's pretty much unchanged. And it comes back, Lorian's idea is that it must be mid to rear engine, it must have 10 mile an hour bumpers, it must be clothed in stainless steel so it would be rust proof and last forever. It's going to have airbags, it was a new thing, 1981. All these little options that he's going to build into it. 
He brings it back to the states, they flesh it out as a prototype. Meanwhile, Allstate loses interest. Now he's got a car. What am I going to do with it? I'm going to build a sports car. He rebadges it DMC and he introduces it to the world as a DMC 12. He starts promoting the automobile, he's looking for investors, he goes to the entertainment industry, he goes to the finance industry, he finds lots of people interested in the automobile. As a leading man at General Motors, he's got a, he has a lot of contracts. So when he goes back out in the world with his own car, there's a lot of people excited about it. Back in 1976, when he makes this announcement, people are thrilled. And this guy is going to build us a car that's going to be safe, it's going to be wonderful. And, you know, so they're really looking forward to it. Well, it takes a few years to develop. He goes to different governments looking for money. Yeah, you know, he's got to build up it. He finally gets the, general, the government of Great Britain to fund him about $108 million if he builds a plant in Northern Ireland and has the car you know, produced there. So they started on the factory. He goes out again. He puts, he's finally gets about $150 million put together. They build the factory in 28 months. He finishes off his prototypes. In December of 1980, they in production of the automobiles. Of course, there's some teething problems. The cars have issues. The engine that he's chosen for it is a PRV V6. That's Puyot Renault Volvo. It's a French built engine. It's built for his design, but when they put the Lotus redesign on the chassis, it's a little heavy. The engine lags a little bit. It doesn't have the power he wants. It doesn't have the performance. It looks great, but it just won't get it down the road like he wants to. So he starts having issues there. There's electrical problems. Johnny Carson receives his, and the alternator goes out on him one night. It just won't keep up with air conditioning and headlights and such as. Lots of issues like that. Of course, the bad press starts to run. Glorian is in trouble that way. The money is hemorrhaging. By the time he's produced his first car, he's already $20 million in the hole. Right? So he's got to come up with some money, and he's got to come up with it fast. But the, French, or the British government's going to close him down. They have, meanwhile, changed government. Maggie Thatcher is now in charge. Conservatives are running the purse. They don't really like pumping money into a losing cause. So yeah, it's, he's got it coming from all sides. As they're working through the quality issues to get the cars going, John DeLorean is out there looking for money again. In October of 1982, he runs a snag of the federal government in less than risky, well, more than risky, in financial scheme. He's arrested. The British government sees this and realizes they're not going to get their 20 million bucks. They pull the plug. The car company's done in December of 82. The automobile parts, unfinished automobiles, are sold in receivership in 83. They go to Consolidated International. Consolidated International is the parent company of Big Lots. So you're buying your 1983 DeLoreans from Big Lots. So they, they sell out the last of the unfished automobiles. They sell the parts They eventually end up in Texas where you can still find DeLorean parts today and get restorations done. Yeah, nice going concern. They figure there's probably just shy of 9,000 DeLorean DMC 12s built. Maybe 6,000 odd available today in running or could be running condition. DMC in Texas is more than willing to help you with that. They've been experimenting with an electrical model. Meanwhile, what we have here today is a DMC 12, 1981, plated in 24 karat gold. The automobile is a promotion. It's developed by John DeLorean and American Express to be advertised in their 1980 Christmas catalog to their gold card members. They intend on selling 100 of these automobiles at $84,000 a piece. This is a $25,000 car covered in a little over two microns of gold, about 560 grams according to Degusa, and it's going to sell for $85,000, $84,000, plus delivery charges. Um, you can buy a Ferrari 308 for about 55 grand. All right? So, the cars are advertised in Christmas of 1980. They're supposed to go into production June 1981. Two cars are ordered out of the 100. They've already contacted with Degusa in West Germany. It cost them $72,000 to set up the plating operation and get panels for three cars plated. That includes the doors, the fenders, and such as, plus all the attaching hardware that goes into these little guys. This is all plated in 24 karat gold back through in here. This automobile is purchased by Sherwood Marshall, Bay Area of California. By the time he gets it in his driveway, it's costing $94,000. It's delivered in October of 1982 or excuse me, 1981, he is going to drive this little extravagance. He's going to enjoy it. So he takes it out on the roads of San Francisco, 
and somewhere along the line one of the doors gets pranked. I didn't catch which one it was. Anyway, they decide they've got to buy a new door because there's no way to repair this stainless steel finish. Have it replated and install it on the automobile. Cost his insurance company $14,000 to repair that door. When they get the bill, they jack his premiums up to $1,000 a month. George decides that he can't afford to drive his extravagance for $1,000 a month. So what's he going to do? He eventually decides he's going to donate it to the National Automobile Museum, the Hera Collection in Reno, Nevada, where we've been the recipient of this wonderful automobile. It has 1,440 odd thousand, excuse me, 1,440 miles on it. Uh, didn't drive it very much. It's one of only two with this tan leather interior. Most all DeLoreans are done in either gray or black. The tan leather was going to be a new offering, and these uh, only two cars were built. With it. So all the other car carpets in the automobile are nice and black, and they don't match. But, you know, it's a and a nice, nice different look to it that way. We've had the automobile in our collection now since the middle 1980s and have preserved it there for everybody to come and enjoy. We hope you come and see the rest of our toys when you come to Reno. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, complaints? <laughs> uh, Jay, uh, I, I don't know. I, I know that I didn't tell you yet, uh, but we, uh, we recently just acquired uh, the file from the Assistant General Counsel it was all the file on these gold cars, all the telexes, all the everything, the originals, and I'll show it, I'll bring it down tomorrow, or we'll see if we can bring it. Yeah, we just got all that, it has, I mean, we just got it last week, uh, and uh, we'll be scanning it, and uh, obviously, uh, yeah, uh, like we're looking at it, yeah, looking at it together, so, I mean, you know, maybe a couple more little tidbits will come out of that, but oh, yeah. it was just very interesting, it has all the delivery documents and, and all that sort of stuff on day that it was delivered, how much it cost, and all the negotiations, and tons of handwritten notes about all the internal things going on uh, with this car. So and I think these this, these cars are going to be uh, really iconic, I, I think, just for America, because it was really at that time of just gold-plated indulgence. I mean, it was just it was just over the top, and there's really nothing more over the top in the modern era than uh, than perhaps this car. It was it was kind of John DeLorean. Well, it wasn't meant to be a swan song. Unfortunately, yeah. it ended up to be that way. Uh, you know, the golden boy of General Motors builds a golden car. I mean, it yeah. doesn't get much cooler than that. He uh, he really was a, a gifted in individual and, and, a, and a huge salesman. It's just a shame that money and time ran out before his patience, I suppose. Uh, DeLorean was cleared of all charges uh, involved in the sting operation and and other SEC issues and that sort of stuff. And, uh, but though exonerated, the money was gone, the time was gone, the opportunity had escaped him. And the car companies like Preston Tucker died with you in the dream. And the, uh, the actual catalog we found is incredibly hard to find, yeah. if at all. And uh, this here is, uh, is a picture of the, uh, the back side of the catalog right. uh, for, uh, for the Christmas catalog, American Express, back in 1980. Uh, to buy something with 85 to buy the $85,000 uh, DeLorean gold plated DeLorean uh, in 1981. You notice the car in this picture here is not any of the cars that were built. Right, they didn't have it. It has the split window in the side. That's one of the uh, early DMC prototypes, and it is actually painted gold. Okay. <laughs> that car still exists, I understand. Well, thank you very much, Jay. Thank you. My pleasure. Pleased to be here. Yeah.